So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bassam Haddad. I'm the founding director of the Middle Eastern Islamic Study, Studies Program at George Mason University and uh, associate professor at the Shard School, also at George Mason. And I am more than delighted to welcome uh, Professor Mulya Mahaley Davis, who is not just the author of the recent uh, re remarkable book, uh, Markets of Civilization, and we'll talk more about it and her bio, but also has been a tremendous contributor to the uh, Pol econ Political Economy Summer Institute that is held at George Mason, uh, usually when it's not uh, online because of COVID, and has a number of other accomplishments uh, under her belt, which we will also hopefully discuss. And uh, before we move forward, let me just say that this event uh, is co-sponsored by uh, the Shar School, the Middle East uh, and Islamic Studies Program at George Mason, uh, and by the Abu Sulaiman Center for Global Islamic Studies, as well as the Arab Studies Institute. Uh, Muriam, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm caffeinating and just boosted, so managing to. Oh my stay god! Awake. Okay, I'm, I'll, yeah. I'll be caffeinating as well throughout. <laughs> and yeah, I'm delighted to be here. The Arab Studies Institute and Jadaliya have been such important hubs, including the political economy um, summer schools. So thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. I was very excited. I've been watching, as you know, uh, so much of your work over the past several years. And now this book is the like a wonderful crown. We will be discussing it at length. But before we start, uh, let me just share the um, bio, which I'm never comfortable with because the bio says very little sometimes about a person, except that we do have to actually share it. Um, if you allow me, Muriam Hali Davis is Associate Professor in the Department of History at UC Santa Cruz. Her recent book, Markets of Civilization, Islam and Racial Capitalism in Algeria, was published by Duke University Press in September 2022, like right now. She has uh, also co-edited North Africa and the Making of Europe, Governance, Institutions and Culture, which was published by Bloomsbury Bury Press in 2018. She published in a Journal of Modern Intellectual History, Middle East Critique, the Journal of Contemporary History, Lateral, and 20A21, or 20A21, Revue d'Histoire. Yes, salam. She has also <laughs> authored pieces of for uh, Al Jazeera English, public books, and Truth Out. She is on the editorial board of MARIP, the Middle East Research and Information Project, and works with the Maghrib page as co-editor of the Maghrib page at Jadalia. So welcome again, um, Muriam, and we are sure. delighted. So are a lot of people that are watching this that have been telling me that uh, they are very excited and looking forward to it. And those who actually are not able to join us absolutely can go back to the uh, Facebook feed on uh, the Middle Eastern Islamic Studies program, as well as the Facebook feed on Jadalia, as well as the YouTube feed on Jadalia, and the Twitter feed on Jadalia to watch this again, and we will be releasing it um, as a video soon as well. Muriam, we are really um, looking forward to this discussion and uh, would like to start with uh, asking you, um, of course, a question about the content of the book. But before we get there, we would like, I would like to ask you about how did the, did the idea come about and uh, whether it was uh, uh, something that you envisioned to be what ended up becoming the book, or was it a number of other things that culminated in this particular volume? Yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, I've been working on this book for probably 15 years now, so it's been a long road. And the idea came to me from various discussions I was having. Um, I did my master's at Georgetown and kind of discovered questions of settler colonialism through Palestine. Um, and then thought about settler colonialism in a broader way and just got really interested with Algeria as a kind of case study or another place where there had been you know, European settlement that dispossessed um, local folks. So, you know, Algeria kind of came to me through that training. And at the same time, I went on from Georgetown to study, um, to start a master's program in cultural theory and critical theory at the University of California, Irvine where the theoretical apparatus kind of came into being. And at that moment, you know, there was a lot of post-colonial studies out there, a lot of people reading Homi Baba, Edward Said, um, Gayatri Spivak. And at the same time that I was totally, 
you know, taken aback and um, inspired by these works, I was also wondering, like, what happened to political economy and all of this? You know, I was also reading some Marxist theory on the side. And so I was thinking, you know, is there a way we could use the tools of post-colonial studies to think about the economy and to think about economic orthodoxies. Um, and I think that's kind of the intellectual question that led me to the book. And the dissertation was very much focused on decolonization and the late colonial period. The book is, has a bit of a wider arc. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Moliam, for this. And uh, before we start, I'd like to share that we will be going for about 30 to 35 minutes uh, and we will then open the floor for questions. People can ask questions on uh, the Facebook feed for Jidalia or the Middle East Islamic Studies program uh, and uh, potentially on YouTube. I am not sure. We have not done that before on YouTube, but people can try. And if they do, I will also relay the questions to uh, Mulyam. All right, so let's delve right into this. Um, I am uh, looking forward to uh, a, a broad discussion, and um, I'm hoping that uh, people can also tune in um, to uh, learn more about this sort of combination uh, of topics that uh, are encapsulated even just by the title. Uh, let me start mm -hmm. by asking you about the uh, about one of the central claims of the book, which is basically that... Um, the French created a racial regime of religion in Algeria. Can you explain what this means and how it helps us understand the story you've been trying to tell or you're, you're telling? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, the, the notion of a racial re regime of religion um, is articulated with Brenna Bundar's work as well. She talks about a racial regime of property. And one of the things I really struggled with in the dissertation was that clearly Islam was central to my story. Um, the mechanism by which Algerian um, indigenous communities are excluded from the state, are excluded from you know, capital accumulation is through the marker of Islam as a legal category. Um, for those who don't know the history of Algeria, I won't get into details, um, but in order, for example, to become a, a French citizen, one had to renounce Islamic uh, civil law. So there's a, a very clear, clear way where personal status law and Islam are the crux of the exclusion of the settler colony. Um, at the same time, and this came about through lots of discussions I was having in France, they said, well, this is about religion. This is not about race. Um, and I am a, a scholar of critical race theory. That's my training. And so I was trying to kind of figure out a way to communicate how um, re religion operates in the Algerian settler colony. And one of the things that I think ended up happening through that discussion was a, a, a realization that it's not just in Algeria, but in that in many cases, the line between religion and race is very porous. And perhaps, you know, we know this from works on anti-Semitism. We can think about this in terms of the British conquest of Ireland. You know, there are lots of other um, places that we could think about this with. But the racial regime of religion as a term is trying to get at the work that religion and legal categories um, does in, a, in the settler colony of Algeria. So that's kind of the theoretical apparatus that I hope, you know, helps me say, yeah, it's not always, you know, religion is not always race. There's, you know, there's certainly, um, we shouldn't go that far, but there are circumstances in which, you know, states use religious belonging um, to structure exclusions and dispossession. And so that's what I'm trying to get through with that term. I hope, I hope that's helpful. I don't want to get too into the into the theory weeds. Um, no, I mean, it's 915 is... in the morning here in California. So, you know, thanks for those who are listening. But yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to do with that term um, is to give some people some tools to grapple with a question that I was grappling with, which is, you know, how do we think about religion and race together? No, absolutely. Uh, no, this is this is, uh, this is a lot and plenty and we will actually be unpacking some things uh, that you have shared. Uh, okay, so the book, um, straddles the French colonial period, but also the years following 1962 after Algeria became independent. And uh, contrary to many expectations, I presume, you actually stress the uh, continuities across this period rather than the ruptures. Can you unpack this for us? Uh... Yeah, um, absolutely. And, you know, by no means do I want to diminish or 
put into question the fact that the Algerian revolution was a revolution and that politically this is a, a world making, um, to use Adam Getachew's phrase, event um, that was incredibly radical in nature. But the book, um, and perhaps I'll just give a little bit about you know, what the book is trying to do concretely. Um, I try to think about how ideas about Islam shaped the political economy of Algeria in the colonial period, but also in the post-colonial period. So, you know, I kind of trace different economic development plans um, and different reforms to show how planners and technocrats um, and also government officials are thinking about Islam um, as they are putting into practice economic policy. So one of the ways I do this in the book is to show how for many in the French state who are you know, these kind of modernizing planners, they assume that Islam um, is against what is needed for a market economy, that there's something about Muslims that they don't have the capacities or aptitudes needed to create or participate in a market economy. And even in people, you know, for people on the left, um, like Pierre Bourdieu, for people who know, you know that work, there are also people on the left who also have a kind of version of this. So this is the assumption that many colonial planners are working with in the 1950s, that you know, Islam is somehow inherently opposed to market societies because of the mental structures and family uh, commitments and collectivities that are ingrained in the religion. Um, and what I show is how after independence, um, the Algerian state also sees Islam as something that has to be accounted for in putting into place economic policy. Uh, but the formulation, as you might imagine, changes dramatically. So now rather than Islam being a break to economic development, Islam becomes necessarily compatible with socialism. And the, you know, specifically um, Algerian socialism that's promoted by the first president Ahmed Ben Bella is you know rooted in a notion of um, you know the Algerian culture and personality and national self but also Islam so you have people coming out and saying you know no it's not that we're inherently incapable of participating in a market economy it's that we are inherently socialist subjects because of our Islamic religion. So in both cases, there is assumed to be something that is inherent in Islam that's important for economic policy. And so that those are the continuities that I mention. And perhaps I'll just also say that when you're dealing with the you know Herculean task of creating the Algerian state, when all of the people who've been running the economy, schools, hospitals, the government are leaving en masse and have been you know, part of the European um, community, it's a really difficult challenge. And so the Algerian state in things like agriculture have no choice really, but to work with the institutions and um, notions of expertise and social scientific uh, knowledge that have been left by the colonial state. And so, you know, for me, that's really interesting because of course, Algeria is this incredibly revolutionary moment with worldwide significance. At the same time, the notion of a kind of clean break or finding something that's outside of modernity, you know, to think about this in perhaps contemporary, you know, decolonial language is really difficult. You know, that even the most radical thinkers of this period are navigating, um, multiple bodies of thought, but they're certainly not able to create something kind of ex nilo from nothing. Um, they're, they're still working within the languages um, of, of the French state, even if it's to overturn that or to reject the central premises. Thanks, Mulyam. I promise myself not to say thank you. Every time I um, do a conversation, um, I'm engaged in the conversation. I, I I keep saying thank you to people responding to my questions. I think it's lovely. I Is think it it's, nice? I think it's very nice to be thanked. Yeah, you oh. don't want to be appreciated. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. So thank thank I, away. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry about it then. Yeah. All right. Let's do that. So uh, I I will not say thank you. Oh no, I will <laughs> say thank you. Oh wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, I think the previous uh, uh, person said you don't have to say thank you. All right. So yeah. Okay. Um, a lot of people who are, you know, listening or who are following uh, are interested in nationalism in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and, and they, I'm assuming, also, uh, you know, focus the reading on the fifth chapter uh, of yours where you talk about the, speci the specificity 
of Algerian nationalism and its relationship with other pan-Arab movements such as Ba'athism in uh, Syria and Iraq. Uh, how does thinking about the history of pan-Arabism and Arab nationalism uh, from Algeria change our understanding of the topic? Uh, this is not, you know, um, I mean, in some areas, not uh, intuitive, uh, given, right. um, you know, given what is often called the heart of Arabism is like in Syria and maybe Egypt during Nasser, uh, so can you yeah. shed some light on this, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, this is the chapter that I think perhaps in some ways brings us um, new archival material in that, you know, I did Arabic language research at AUB um, in some of the student activist, um, student bath party events that they were putting on for Algeria. Um, and I was also reading some of the bath party materials coming out of Syria and Iraq. And I think um, for many people who've worked on Algeria um, in this kind of internationalist or pan-Arab capacity, those sources haven't really been looked at. So this was something that I was you know, really happy to be able to do. Um, but it's curious because there are all of these um, discussions on the, on the kind of pan-Arab left, if we want to call that, about what Algeria is. And so as, you know, Fadi Badawil and others have shown, Algeria is hugely important for kind of pan-Arab thought. You know, it, this is the, the moment um, kind of anti-colonial struggle that many people across the region are watching and invested in and have real emotional ties to. Um, but there is a question about on what basis one would consider Algeria part of a pan-Arab sphere precisely because um, you know, Arabism had been less prominent in Algeria, both because linguistically the French, you know, really destroyed the Arabic language. Um, so, you know, Ben Bella himself, uh, his his ability to speak modern standard Arabic is more or less inexistent. Um, so, you know, how do you how are you integrated into pan Arabism when you know you have that kind of destruction of culture? But also in Algeria, you have um, right, you have lots of um, Amazigh people who are, don't consider themselves Arab first and foremost, right? So Islam becomes a way to integrate many different communities into a national community after 1962. Um, but Arabism isn't always the, the vein in which they do so, is what I argue. And I, and I, and I understand this is a, a controversial argument, um, but I look at you know, publications like Al-Adab and other, you know, other political leftist orientations that are saying, you know, is, is what is, why is Algeria Arab? You know, how do we consider Algeria alongside of places like Lebanon or Syria or Iraq? Um, and there's a lot of disagreement around that. So, you know, even though um, we think about, you know, Ben Bella and Nasser as having this really um, rich relationship, and in some ways there was a lot of you know, Egyptian help during the Algerian revolution, it was always a very uneasy one as well, um, given Algeria's, you know, uh, both place in the Arab world, but also its own specificities historically, linguistically, and even in terms of, um, you know, the kinds of people who have been living there over the last 100, 200 years or going, you know, all the way back. Um, and of course, there's lots of things that one could also say about the Jewish community, but I'll leave that um, perhaps for another time. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to remember if you want me to say thank you or if you don't want me to say. I, I realize. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so what I'd like to um, ask you about is the uh, pedagogic aspect of um, uh, this book, teaching this book. As as you probably know, uh, we're very interested in uh, in uh, making resources available uh, to educators uh, in the classrooms. And my, my question is, what kind of classes you think this book mm -hmm. will be taught in? And um, which chapters would you assign for various topics? And the extent to which uh, the book is, I, I, you know, the word might be a bit too much, but accessible to both mm -hmm. undergrads and grads. Um, if you can tell us just a little bit about uh, these uh, matters, uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I really hope that the book is accessible to undergrads. Um, it's certainly not a beach read. I wouldn't like, you know, give it to my aunts uh, to read over a weekend. But I do think that parts of it um, in particular would be useful for teaching in an undergraduate classroom, um, particularly the first chapter, 
where I really give a kind of synthetic overview of the political economy of Algeria, you know, even going back to the Ottoman period, um, right up through World War One, and I show how ideas about Algerians and about Islam um, play a role at different moments. And of course, uh, the political economy of Algeria is changing at many different periods of um, the empire. But nevertheless, I, I argue that, you know, we can think about Islam as an element in, you know, everything that kind of that um, in many discussions, at least around the economy. And so I think as a kind of introduction to what is the what is the political economy of a settler colony, you know, look like, like, how does the economy play a role in these myths um, around race and religion? I think the first chapter is perhaps the most accessible. Um, and then, you know, I also think um, that this, you know, the second, the middle chapters are perhaps a little bit more theoretical, but for, for grad students interested, for example, in questions of market economies and commodities in the second chapter, I look at, um, oh, wow, we have my table of contents. Um, this is very exciting. Thank you. I'm for forgetting which chapter. Yeah, the second chapter, A New Algeria Rising, um, has a, a large discussion about wine and olive oil as two commodities that need to be modernized and standardized and how notions of um, Muslim aptitudes or European aptitudes plays a role in this because of course wine is a historically European product and olive oil is mostly um, produced by, um, by Algerian Muslims or by Algerians. Um, you know, the third chapter, I look at decolonization and the Constantine plan. The Constantine plan is this kind of wildly uh, ambitious development plan introduced by Charles de Gaulle during the Algerian revolution. Um, and that chapter, I think, is very useful for thinking about uh, the Algerian war and European integration together. So I show how a lot of the same assumptions uh, and techniques of planning that are used in European integration are also put into place um, in Algeria. And it has perhaps my favorite quote from the book, which is when one of my planners says um, that thanks to the Constantine plan, uh, homo Islamicus will be turned into homo economicus. Um, and these two figures kind of fascinated me, you know, homo Islamicus on the one hand and all the Orientalist baggage around that figure and it being used as a foil for something called, um, you know, homo economicus, which, you know, we think about in terms of Adam Smith or discussions on neoliberalism. So this quote, um, you know, I wanted to be the title of the book from homo Islamicus to homo economicus, but it's a mouthful. And I think my editor is quite rightly said, that's a terrible title, don't do that. Um, you know, then from there, I'm really interested in um, rural reforms around agriculture. Um, the fourth chapter looks at the question of the Fallah and who is the Fallah in Algeria and how do they get romanticized um, by the Algerian nationalists, but also how do the French social sciences make sense of the Fallah as a peasant, right? Like, do, are these categories uh, commensurate or not? Um, and then the book goes into kind of, you know, the question of Arab nationalism, Islam and um, self-management. Um, you know, Algeria also attracts all these third worldists, um, Europeans as well. People like Michel Raptis, um, better known as Pablo, who come to help Ben Bella get um, autogestion or self-management off the ground. And they have their own understanding of Islam and the economy and revolution. Um, and so that's what I get into with the last chapter in chapter six is, uh, is not only um, the kind of radical uh, Trotskyists who come, but also the kind of international development cooperation um, folks, right, who are also starting to descend on Algeria as a place um, for international economic development. So that's kind of the arc of the book. Um, and yeah, I think that there are things, you know, in it, I think the heart of the book is probably the third chapter. So for graduate students, you know, who want to think about market economies, race, religion, you know, during decolonization, I would probably um, give, give, you know, point them to chapter three. Absolutely. Um, so let me, uh, let me ask you if, um, given that the, the book, which I have, uh, I'll be honest, I, I, I couldn't get through the whole thing before uh, this interview because That's you were funny. so gracious and you said yes. And then you said, Monday and I was like, oh my God. So, <laughs> Sorry, I'm, yeah, I'm traveling tomorrow. So thank you for doing no, this. So last I'm, minute. I'm, I'm, yeah. We're very grateful that you were able to make it. Uh, but I've uh, read enough 
uh, of it, uh, and I have seen you uh, operate uh, in various public uh, settings uh, and otherwise, uh, to know that you actually pulled together several strands based on um, uh, various legacies, uh, social theoretic and otherwise. So you're addressing colonialism, you're addressing capitalism, you're addressing race, you're addressing religion, you're addressing everything about Algeria. Not just the history of Algeria, but also the contemporary developments, which, as some might know, if they are following what we do, um, I have conducted a, a few interviews with you, actually, about what has been happening in Algeria in the context of the protests in the past uh, two or three years. Um, so if, if someone wants to uh, read up uh, mm -hmm. on any of these topics, any of these dimensions, um, is there something that uh, they would need to take a look at before getting to this book? Or is there something that would help understand uh, what is going on in the manner in which you bring things together? You bring the, this constellation of uh, social theoretic um, uh, uh, trajectories and legacies. Um, or yeah, are there people? That's a great question. Are there people yeah. that that you recommend uh, people, you know, people read? Uh, I know that in the Pol Political Economy Summer Institute, um, you've addressed uh, a number of uh, authors uh, addressing racial capitalism, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it was fascinating to 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 hear you at that time uh, address those matters, but. You can either discuss books or people that you think would be uh, good either as accompaniments or background. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, it's interesting to think about the field of racial capitalism as it is right now and, and kind of what that means. And, you know, it's in the title of the book. But for me, racial capitalism is really a discussion about race and the economy um, that wants to go further than just saying um, that, you know, certain certain groups uh, suffer the worst edges of capitalism based on their religious or racial identity or something like that, right? There's a notion that we can talk about uh, race and capitalism as, you know, race helps um, have access to cheap labor or does, you know, helps function in capitalism, which is a little bit different than the discussion of racial capitalism, which tries to think about how capitalism itself is theorized um, through notions of human difference and extractive practices on different kinds of human bodies. But, you know, it's not um, for those people who have read Cedric Robinson, who is, you know, the most widely cited person, I'd say, in Black Marxism. Um, you know, I always have graduate students who say, you know, I thought there'd be a theory of racial capitalism. Um, and there's not. There is a kind of constellation of really wonderful works and tools to think with. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, that Robin Kelly's article, I think it's in Boston Review, what is racial, what did Cedric Robinson mean by racial capitalism is a wonderful primer. Um, and then what I try to do from there is think, well, what does that look like in the Mediterranean? Because many of these, many of these discussions have been focused on the Atlantic world. And what does it mean when it's not necessarily, you know, skin color, but rather religion when is the operative category. So I'm trying to kind of play with this conceptual universe, but that's where I'd go for folks who just kind of want to cut their teeth on um, racial capitalism. In terms of the scholarship on Algeria, there's so much exciting work and so many brilliant colleagues who are writing on Algeria from a number of angles right now. Um, Donald Hassett, Arthur Asaraf, Malika Rahal, I, I mean, I could keep, I could go on and on. And, um, but, you know, I think the best kind of historical overview is James McDougall's A History of Algeria. I think it's just, it's a magistral um, kind of overview of different periods of Algerian history. So for people who just, you know, feel like they maybe don't quite have um, the historical background. Having said that, I try really hard in the book to not assume um, prior knowledge of Algerian history or politics. I try to, to give a lot of context and to kind of hold the reader's hands um, because I'm hoping that people from different fields read the book who are not specialists um, in Algerian history. So, you know, those are the two. For the Hirak, um, I will plug the, the Jadalia Maghreb page. We had a kind of, we've had some essential reading posts about Algeria. We've had some great coverage and analysis of the Hirak um, by lots of different people. So that's also, I think, a good resource. But um, the Hirak and the protests really just come up in my epilogue where I'm thinking about how uh, figures like Malik Ben-Nabi are taken up 
um, in the Hirak and through you know, different kinds of um, political dynamics at work in those protests. Wonderful. Um, so uh, can, I, can I ask you to do something um, odd, which is basically uh, try to connect, if this is at all possible, the implications of um, uh, what you address in the book to the more contemporary history of Algeria? Uh, is, it, uh, is, is the distance too uh, vast uh, for us to, uh, to make any connections or can we see some vestiges uh, of uh, the effect of that era uh, today? Yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't want to overstate yeah. the effects and how they continue, but certainly um, the ways in which many of you know Algerian technocracy is still one of the main feeders of the regime, for example, um, you know, the, and so you can see what one of my interests is on kind of technocrats and state planning and how they are reading the social sciences, and so certainly there's an arc that one could follow there. Um, you know, there's also an arc, I think, to think about language and, you know, the Arabic language and Islam um, that one could also kind of think with. But I wouldn't say that there's a kind of, you know, one to one correspondence. Um, I touch on the Civil War a little bit in the in the conclusion, um, really to say that this notion that sometimes we have that the, about the Civil War being kind of a neat division of two sides or a war of languages. Um, is, is very oversimplified to what the intellectual discussions actually were. So uh, I think that there are some ways to reflect on the contemporary moment, but the book itself really start, ends in 1965. Um, however, you know, I think for also people in Middle Eastern studies um, who see Algeria as you know, both really fundamental to many things happening in the region because of the revolution, perhaps even because of the civil war, um, and yet, you know, kind of want to understand better the specificity of Algeria um, and perhaps the Maghreb in general. Um, the book helps do that, you know, without collapsing uh, Algeria into Middle Eastern studies where, the, you know, the, the people who are, I think, often trained in Middle Eastern studies come away with a really, you know, a, a, a focus on Palestine, on Egypt, maybe on the Levant, perhaps more and more the Gulf now. But, you know, it's um, the Maghreb has long been a little bit marginal to those conversations. So I hope um, you know, I hope that I'm, I'm helping unpack some of that as well for, for scholars. Thank you. Um, I would like to also uh, ask about, um, you know, in, in, the, in the past, I mean, maybe 10 years, 15 years, um, or although there's no number, uh, we seem to be uh, learning more about the Maghrib or at least seeing more production, knowledge production about the Maghrib in a way that, at least to my knowledge, in the 1990s, um, you know, there was like a, there was a gap between the knowledge mm -hmm. produced on the Mashriq and Egypt uh, as opposed to the Maghrib. Uh, is this, is this uh, first of all, do you see more knowledge production yourself on the Maghrib compared to before, or is it just because I am getting more and more interested in this? Not least because of uh, you know my own work and my and my uh, you know uh, engagement with Jadalia, uh, and is this is this a trend um, expanding? Does it have to do with the Arab uprisings? Uh, mm. and, and because there's there's a sad thing whereby we, we we joke about how people don't know very much about the Middle East in the United States, uh, and then we can mention North Africa and Algeria and and the Maghreb. Uh, or Morocco and so on, but then a lot of people in the mm. Arab world don't know as much, like in the Mashriq, uh, of the, the eastern part of the Arab world, also don't know, I mean, sure. to extent that much. So is this, is this changing? And why? You know, I, I do think the scholarship, there's, like I mentioned, there's so much wonderful work being done on Algeria in particular and the Maghreb in general. Um, and I think, you know, the, the scholarship on the Maghreb has historically been torn between people trained in French history and people trained in Middle Eastern history. And I would say it was quite possible and still is um, in in France and, and in some quarters to work on Algeria and not speak Arabic, for example, to not be trained in Arabic. And so that creates a kind of, you know, cottage industry within 
French studies or within um, French empire, uh, where it makes sense that those people are reading and interested in North Africa. Absolutely. Um, but th those are quite different questions than the ones posed if you're coming at the region from Middle East studies. Um, you're asking a different set of questions. You're reading a different set of sources. Um, and of course, you know, ho hopefully uh, that has to do with languages as well. So I do think that that has really evolved in that um, the, the hegemony of French studies over the Maghreb is, is really is no longer um, the case. And um, Mesa is the home, I think, of most people who work on the Maghreb um, to a certain to a certain extent. Um, you know, in terms of kind of the misunderstandings or um, projections of people from, you know, between the, Maj the Mashrik and the Maghreb, um, Alger Algerian Twitter is hilarious. I would, um, you know, there are lots of jokes about kind of, you know, I went to Egypt and somebody thought I only spoke French because I'm Algerian. You know, there is there is a, a linguistic and historical um, set of questions that emerge in the Maghreb that are different than the rest of the region. Um, and so, you know, I'll just put it there. I, I think um, that it's it's not surprising. It's nobody's being malintentioned here. Uh, it's just, um, you know, often people not having that much contact or thinking that, you know, um, you know, all, all, all Algerians um, only speak French or something like that. But these, you know, these are caricatures and stories that you, you see on social media or by talking to folks that are kind of the most extreme uh, you know, the anecdote that one wants to tell at a dinner party, I don't think they get at the reality of, of the situation. Thank you, Mulyam. Um, I have a couple quick questions. Um, and one of them is, do you want to say something or plug the lexicon uh, that you worked on uh, regarding the Herak movement? As it yeah, is one of the absolutely. more fascinating things that, uh, that I've seen. It's very interesting, especially if you're interested in language as well. Yeah, um, and it, you know, it wasn't just me. There was a team of us working on that. Um, but it's uh, a kind of um, dictionary of uh, different slogans that were being used in the Herak and also explaining them linguistically. Um, a lot of them are coming from Darija, so explaining the Darija, which is you know very um, specific to Algeria. Um, it's, it's a mix of French, Spanish. Um, you know, there's, it's a linguistic uh, potpourri that way. And so what we tried to do is to explain not only the political significance of the slogan, but also to think a little bit about the languages in which this is being expressed. Awesome. Um, well, before, before I let you go, I mean, we, we actually are not receiving tons of um, questions. Uh, so let me ask this, uh, considering that you are also a football enthusiast <laughs> and we're talking about the real football, which is the football, the game you play or the sport you play with your feet, <laughs> not, you know, handball uh, <laughs> with occasional kicks, uh, which is what is called American football. I know I keep saying this. I'm, I'm not going to get over it. And I will not say the it, word that I, starts I think we can, we can provincialize American football. I think that this is I mean, a, you know, a, worthy, yeah. a worthy endeavor. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable how this <laughs> happened. It's one of the miracles of the world, right? Uh, anyway, so um, uh, Algeria didn't make it to the... Yeah, very world sad. Cup. What's going on? And, and, and is, is, this, is this a big thing in Algeria? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of moments of political and sporting disappointment in Algeria right now. And certainly this is one of them. And there have been a number of, um, kind of footballistic uh, diplomatic issues with Morocco, um, including kind of the Juniors Cup final that happened uh, a few weeks ago. So, you know, the, I, I do think Algerians are going to rally behind Morocco or Tunisia or both. There, there will be a pan Maghreb, despite all the diplomatic mess of the region right now. Um, absolutely. You know, I don't want to, I, I was just came back from Tunis and Insaniyat. I picked up my, my Tunisia jersey, um, you know, no, um, no ill intention for any Morocco uh, people out there. I just wasn't in Morocco, so I couldn't get a jersey. But um, but yeah, I think it will be interesting to see out to see how the current political conjecture in the Maghreb um, plays out through the World Cup, where you know Morocco and Tunisia qualified, and unfortunately the Fenech uh, did not. Okay, well, thank you. I know that we will be we will be talking about this. Uh... Uh, going forward, so uh, I look forward I to look that. I look forward to it. And so before we let you go, 
um, unless we get a barrage of questions, I'd like to ask you about uh, what's next in terms of uh, your work and your research, and where where do you go from here? Given that uh, this this is, I mean, I think this is a monumental uh, work, and I don't know yeah. anybody that knows your work who's who's not looking. Uh, to learn more about it or to see where you're going next and, and what you're up to next. So is there a glimpse of kind. what's coming next? Yeah, there's um, glimpse is the right word, I think. Um, I've been trying to start a second project on this, the discipline of sociology in Algeria after independence. So I think one of the things that the book does is think about the social sciences and how does the social sciences, like how do they structure um, the way we think about the world, right? The discipline of economic planning, the discipline of anthropology. And so I'm really interested in that discussion now um, after Algerian independence. So starting in 1962, um, and there are lots of reasons why sociology is fascinating for me as a discipline. The Algerian state um, really bans anthropology as a colonial endeavor in, 19, in the 1970s. And so um, sociology comes to be the kind of state making revolutionary um, uh, discussions. And so I'm, I'm interested in that. I'm also starting to, to think about Algeria-Pakistan connections. Um, I'm of South Asian origin. I always promised I would never work on South Asia. I would never work on my own empire. So I guess I'm seeing a bit of the return of the repressed and, um, you know, sharpening my Urdu skills and, and seeing um, what Algeria and Pakistan, you know, had in common and, and conversations be, you know, among the two regions. So, uh, but this is all very much in the future. Absolutely. And why why do we, you wouldn't talk about these other topics? Um, in terms of South Asia? Yeah. You know, it was something in, in grad school um, where people just assumed that if you were South Asian, you were going to work on South Asia. And um, I, I didn't want to work on South Asia. I didn't want to have to you know, go through my own families. It was too close to home, perhaps. Um, you know, I didn't want to start talking about the British colonization with family or, um, you know, I was interested in the Middle East and my Arabic, I was speaking Arabic much better than I was speaking Urdu at the time. So um, I wanted the kind of freedom to choose a academic subject that wasn't my own family history. Um, and, you know, everybody, some people are doing wonderful work on auto theory and on studying their own family backgrounds, which is fantastic as well. I just, you know, I wasn't ready, perhaps, back then. So, um, so we'll see where that goes. I actually thought it was had something to do with the actual uh, topic and, and, and the country and so on and the history, because I uh, will never work on where I'm from. Yeah. And, but for different reasons. And that is because, well, it's Lebanon. Because uh, I feel bad for people who do because it's really, you know, it's a, I mean, the word mess is, is, is a severe understatement. And uh, yeah, yeah uh, you think you got it and, and you think you got it and you right. did get it, but you, you kind of didn't. Uh, right, so, right. so yeah, I understand that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Muriam, you've been very generous uh and uh i really really appreciate uh, uh, you uh sharing with us uh all of this about uh, your book and we do hope to uh, speak with you again but uh, before i let you go there's a very quick question which is kind of uh, broad by mm -hmm. kyle anderson uh who yeah, says uh he or they would love to hear more about chapter four. So if you can say a couple of words, yeah. and I promise we will let you go so you can continue your life. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. And thank you for that question. Um, so one of the things that I look at in chapter four is um, all of the questions of land reform and agricultural modernization. And the the framing mechanism of this is how are people thinking about the fellah, as I already mentioned. And there is an entire debate whether the French fellah can be um, compared to the French paysan or peasant. And what you see is that the, the fellah comes to 
operate as a kind of civilizational category rather than an economic one, right? So it's not necessarily how many hectares of land or a certain kind of sub, you know, subsistence economy. Um, it's really about the kind of cultural mores of the fellah. Um, and so in addition to that, the chapter looks at attempts to introduce private property and land ownership among rural Algerians, of course, in the context of a very violent war. So um, this attempt, you know, Folks out there might know the Eugene Weber transforming peasants into Frenchmen. Um, and so the, the, the phrase I'm playing with the fellah into peasants is transforming, you know, transforming the Algerian fellah into a French paysan or peasant. And what, um, what is the imagined distance culturally um, and what kind of aptitudes and capacities would they need to be able to do that? So, um, so yeah, that's chapter four. And of course the question of um, security and war and mobility is really also at the heart of, of that chapter. So, you know, the recruitment centers, um, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much uh, again, uh, Maryam, for this and for your um, entire uh, conversation and the work that you've done and your contributions to this very important topic, which actually brings together a lot of other topics, which is why I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, it is it is so nonlinear uh, and in, in, in terms of the uh, various uh, strands that you actually address. And I uh, urge everyone to get a copy from Stanford University Press. There is a uh, Duke, Duke University oh, Press. Oops. <laughs> nope. So, not Duke from University. Stanford, I yeah. Actually just With all due respect to Stanford, yeah. We just <laughs> publishing lots of great stuff. In the Jedalia uh, announcement. Uh, so from Duke University Press, although Stanford also has really good books, uh, exactly, and um, we have a link in the uh, Jadalia post, and we will actually repost this as a video, uh, as an edited video, um, where you can also click on the link to uh, get a copy of uh, Professor Davis's Markets of Civilization. Thanks again. Um, Great, thanks so much for having me, Bassam. Good to see will, you. We will see you soon. I'm sure. Yeah, see you in Denver. Have a, have a wonderful Shalom. day. Thanks. Take care. Take care.